Welcome to the Patron Services Fall Roundtable 2015. I'm Anna Gobin, the Evergreen Indiana Coordinator here at the Indiana State Library. I'm joined today by Virginia Jensen from the Mooresville Public Library and Laura Hall from the Peabody Public Library. They both sit on the Patron Services Committee and have volunteered to present today. We're going to open our program with a review of the upcoming OverDrive integration into our catalog. Then we'll talk about the patron registration process and close with a discussion about communications. Thank you for joining us. This is Virginia Jensen, and I want to talk about ebooks in the Evergreen catalog, helping your patron find the ebooks they need. Coming soon to an Evergreen catalog near you. Are you ready to answer patron questions about ebooks listed in the catalog? I hope that by the end of the presentation you will be. You know they're going to ask. So I've used the uh, migration okay. server to um, pull up examples. Um, and ebooks are listed here from all three of the OverDrive um, consortiums. The first one I want to look for is Carrie by Stephen King. Um, and I just put in the title and author, um, and we can see that there is an e-audio vision or version, the DVD, the book. Um, let's go with the e-audio, and we we see here that we have all three consortiums are listed, so that we can click for access. Uh, this is the E-Indiana Digital Consortium, and it is available. If your library is part of that consortium, all the patron needs to do is click Borrow. If you're E-Indiana Digital Download, um, you, your patrons can also borrow. And Indiana Digital Media also has a copy. So it's available to any of these three ebook consortia that are currently used by Evergreen Libraries. Let's check another title. Harry Turtledove is my son's favorite author, so let's look for one of his books. The Big Switch, The War That Came Early, is available in e-audio and e-books. Uh, first, we'll go to the e-audio books. And again, you see all three consortia listed. It's available on uh, E-Indiana Digital Consortium. The book is not available to Indiana Digital Download patrons, but there is a button that says Recommend. So you can request or recommend that book to uh, the Indiana Digital Download Consortium. The Indiana Digital Media Consortium does have the book in an e ebook, I'm sorry, an audio format, uh, so those patrons can check it out and listen to the story. But maybe you want to read it. Well, let's look at that. Um, again, we have um, links to each of the consortia. E Indiana has the book, and you can borrow it. Indiana Digital Download shows several versions both Kindle, Overdrive Read, and EPUB. And Indiana Digital Media also has the ebook available, Kindle, or Overdrive, and EPUB. So let's check one more book. Uh, this time it's Love Letters by Beverly Lewis. The title is available as a printed book, a large print, or an ebook version. So the ebook listing again has all three consortia. Indiana Digital, I'm uh, sorry, E-Indiana Digital Consortium copies are all checked out, but you can place a hold. Indiana Digital Download has a waiting list, so again you can place a hold. And Indiana Digital Media has an available copy. You can use the search filters to find only print titles or only ebook or e-audio titles. Um, but some of our, our patrons get confused when they see all the different listings and don't know 
which one to choose. So you can advise them on how to see just the print books or just audio or ebooks. There are titles in the consortia that are not going to be in the Evergreen catalog. There are magazines that are available on Overdrive, but they are not listed. Items with limited circulations will not be listed. If a title is listed but not available to your consortium, there will be a recommend button on the consortium website. There also is a buy it now feature through Amazon that will help uh, fund your digital consortium. There's a button called buy it now. So how many people are confused? The materials that OverDrive classifies as metered. In other words, when you license them, you get 12 months use or 26 circulations. Because of the level of maintenance we're talking about for those records, we've chosen not to integrate them at this time. Currently, popular metered titles include Gail Foreman's If I Stay series, Harper Lee's Go Set a Watchman, and Paula Hawkins' The Girl on the Train. It's not uncommon for the publishers of very popular titles to only release them as metered. If there's a title that you really, really want to have in the catalog for a metered item, your cataloger can import or create a record as long as they're committed to maintaining it. Your library is then responsible for removing the record if the license isn't renewed. Once we get through the trainings and finalize the patron support page, we're targeting a mid-November implementation. There will be a patron support page that will let the patron search to find out which consortium their library is associated with. Yes. By the way, if your users are using another interface to access OverDrive, this won't change or affect that at all. This is just another way for our patrons to find the available materials. And now we'll turn this over to Laura Hall. Okay. Um, this is just a review of patron res registration with some things you may or may not be aware of yet. Um, why did you do that is one of my questions and is this something new? Patron registration review, I hope to include uh, verify eligibility by service area, search the Evergreen database for duplicate accounts, optional registration fields to consider using, user settings for holds notification, main profile permission group, and helpful Evergreen links. Patron interview is very important in verifying eligibility. The first question we always use, may I see your photo ID? And you may need to ask the parent or guardian if it's a minor for their photo ID. Um, if it's not expired, you can continue. Next question, is this your current address? If yes, you have enough information to begin address verification. However, if no, search the current address anyway that the patron gives you to let the patron know if he will be eligible for a card or not. No use sending him away for the information um, to have him come back and you find out that he's not eligible for the card anyway. Provide information about alternative forms of address verification. And it is acceptable to view this verification. Uh, the, the patron can pull it up on his smartphone or head over to your internet computer and get a computer printout. So for address verification, step one, search the address using the Evergreen interactive map. On the Evergreen splash page, select locate address in map. So uh, answer me these questions. I know about it and use it, A. B, I know about it, but don't use the map, or C, I didn't know about it. Just a quick little poll of who's actually using this. Okay, mostly A's, know about it and use it, some B, some C. I am going to search my own address, and it brought me up. You'll notice three different colors on the map. We have green, which means that is an evergreen service area. Gray means that there is library service, but they're not an evergreen library. And if it's white and you click on it, it opens nothing up. They have no library service. 
This is another site. We have been using Beacon since before we were evergreen. Does anybody else know about it and use it? Do you know about it but don't use it? Or did you just not know about it? So far, a few people answered that they do use it. Several people don't know about it. Okay, one reason you may not know about it, and I'll go ahead and select Indiana, and then I will select my county. Your county or city area may not be in the list. And um, you can do a property search or a view map search. I like doing the property search by address. Once again, I'll do my address. And this is the page where we will see, is that patron actually in your service area based on tax set? And if this came up as a patron's search result, we would know they do have evergreen service. You can also view that um, address in a map and see where it fits into the scheme of things in your county. We're on back to the patron interview. We know whether or not we're even going to talk to them because we know they are or are not in our service area. Um, the first question after that is, have you always used this last name? And I have found more than just women who have changed their last names. So it's always a good question when you're looking in the Evergreen database to know how many different um, name variations or changes they've had. I've had people with three or four different last names, some with actually three different last names in the system, and uh, we also get men who change their last names. You may need to search more than one last name. And the next question would be, do you always go by your first name? They don't always. You may need to, plus you may need to search for variations of the first name. Um, middle names are sometimes used as first names and sometimes nicknames are used. And when we had legacy accounts, um, we used nicknames, we used partial names, we used middle names. We didn't go by the standard ID, um, photo ID name, which we do now. Um, it makes things a lot simpler as far as comparing to other names in the database. Once you've gathered all name information, you can begin your Evergreen database search. Don't be too shy to ask, have you always gone by this name? We're all familiar with the search page. There are many ways to bring up this search page. I would type in the person's last name. And then if I am doing a search for something other than, let's say, Smith or Jones, that's going to have a ton of hits. Like for um, my last name, I would probably just put my first initial, and that would give me more hits that instead of writing spelling my name right out. Say I would uh, possibly have gone by Laura or Lori then I would only get one of the responses if I typed my name all the way out. Remember to include inactive patrons as well as search the whole of Evergreen, Indiana and not just your library. Here is a search that I did and I just wanted to show you a couple of instances. There are two patrons with the date of birth, um, 2001 September 17. One is listed with a middle name, the other with a middle initial, and this is a potential duplicate account. Birth dates match, first and last name matched, middle name matched. August is another potential duplicate, no middle names are listed. In some cases, patrons don't have middle names, and that could be noted on the patron's account for future reference. Any questions about uh, searching patron names. When we're searching the Evergreen database, certain fields are used to determine duplicate accounts, such as last name. Last name is required, first name is required, but the middle name is optional. 
um, I think we might want to consider using that middle name as we just saw it could be helpful in searching out duplicate patrons date of birth is required one thing I did notice when we went when we migrated from Circe to Evergreen a lot of our birth dates were at a default January 1st 2012 or whatever it was or whatever the birthday was but everybody's birthday was January 1st or uh, some of the birth dates got mixed up in a different way when they were still evergreen patrons um, I mean excuse me still Cersei patrons so date of birth being required does not always give you a match on legacy accounts depending on how the migration might have messed with that date of birth Primary identification is optional. That would be like your driver's license or ID card number. And the parent guardian is optional for a minor's account. Address is required, but it's often unreliable. How many times do patrons bring in alternate forms of address and then shows you a photo ID that doesn't have that address on it. So if somebody were to come to me with a photo ID that hasn't been updated, I'm not going to be able to match to an address that hasn't um, been updated. I guess this would not so much be in a case for looking for duplicate accounts, duplicate accounts, but more if somebody wanted to update their account and they came in with their photo ID, but it doesn't have the same address on it that they used to register because they provided alternate uh, information at the time. So addresses are often reliable just because also people move a lot and we are the last place they update their information at. There are very few required fields for patron registration. They're highlighted in yellow. I'm going to present some reasons to consider using some of the optional fields. Prefix title because of gender neutral names. Um, sometimes this can be very embarrassing, especially if the person standing before you at the desk doesn't um, give you a strong feeling as to whether it's male or female, whether the person is male or female. And if they have a name like Jordan, uh, you're not always going to address the person correctly. If you're calling somebody on the phone, and leaving him or her a message, it would be nice to be able to leave the message using the right um, ad type of address. I know we have gotten caught up when we have called somebody a ma'am or a sir, and they get a little bit irate. Uh, Jamie is another one that is a gender neutral name. We have a gentleman named Jamie, and I have a co-worker, and her name is Jamie. So it can cause some embarrassment and some uh, resentment on the part of patrons if you mm, don't refer to them correctly. Middle name. It would help with patron searches for duplicate accounts. And the OPEC staff client holds alias. If you fill that space in, that is what's going to print on the holds slip instead of the patron name. So if your patron wanted to be more private about what is printed on their hold slip, this would be a good place to put their alternate slip display, displayed name, and also it's useful in creating groups, for instance homebound and bookmobile groups. At Peabody, we use homebound in that field along with the patron's name so that we know it's an item that needs pulled to give to the people who do homebound deliveries. Driver's license for better patron searches. Um, 
and for verification if your library chooses to allow patron ID for checkout. Uh, sometimes your patron misplaces their card, they come up to your desk for checkout and would like to be able to show you their ID instead of their library card. And this is being looked at as a home rule option. So if your patron pulls out their driver's license and their name matches, but the driver's license address doesn't match, it's a good bet that if you have the driver's license or ID card number, you're going to have a better chance at having found the right patron in your database. Parent guardian for better juvenile searches. Um, this is another area that the Patron Services Committee is looking at where having this field filled in would be beneficial. Uh, we're looking at the ability to move fees from a child's account on majority to the patron guardian record. If you have the patron guardian name on the account already, that would make this much easier. Uh, user settings. This group of fields sets the default hold pickup location and automated notification options for the user's account. When these fields are used, it is highly unlikely that a patron would miss a hold notice. Any questions about the optional fields that I've talked about or any questions about any of the other fields in registration? Do, does it look like you may change how you do your registrations based on the information? Yes, uh, we use county also. And one thing we also started doing, let's see if I can get there, on the type, since we already know what the mailing and billing address is, instead of having mailing writ written in there, we actually put the township that our patron belongs to. Um, it could probably have been added as a statistical category, but we type in our patron's township um, or taxing district or if they're, yeah, so anyway, that's another way that we use the address field too. Okay, main profile permission group. Are any of these profiles new to you? There are just a couple that I have time to bring to your attention that might be new. That would be temp and transitional. Does anybody use temp or transitional at this time? If you are considering um, giving a card for individuals who do not reside the full year in your library district, you would use a temporary card. Examples would, could include relocated workers and summer home residents. A transitional patron is an optional profile for libraries wishing to offer services to patrons without a permanent home in their library district. Uh, to take advantage of this type of card, the patron would need to find a sponsor and the card would only be good for, I believe, three months with only three items to be checked out cumulatively on the account. The transitional profile is intended for persons who are in a state of flux mm -hmm. who are living in your community. Um, Common programs that I'm familiar with are, again, migrant farm workers, shelters, things like that. Anytime where someone's in a homeless type. Position, position where they simply cannot provide proof of residency, but need the services that your library can provide. It 
It's created so that it has a limited impact uh, fiscally, both for the patron and for the library. And sponsors. Sponsors get to be kind of complicated, but that is defined by your library. The library may choose to be the primary sponsor and just take on the, everything there. You may want to work with an organization in your community that supports these users in some other fashion. Their only li liability is the expectation that you can reach out to them to request assistance in communicating with that user if for some reason you should lose track of them and they still have your materials. Okay. Communications. We need to talk. I know. We already talk a lot amongst ourselves. We've uh, accomplished a lot with building a community where we can feel free to communicate with one another. But I wanted to go over a couple of things just to keep in mind as you're planning your communication opportunities. If you are ever struggling to find a point of contact, uh, you're going to want to try to visit the communications page. As you may or may not have noticed, I've been moving more of the stuff off of the state servers and onto the Evergreen servers, so you're going to see a lot more links that start with blog.evergreen. It does not mean that these are blog entries. They are just happen to be pages that are hosted on that site. To find communications, just hover over the About Evergreen and Communications is the second option down. And there are all manner of things on the communications page, including your committee contact list. Anytime that you have questions that you or concerns that you want to take to the committee, you should feel free to approach the committee members. Their email addresses are there. Their library information is there if you would prefer to call them and just chat about the issues. The committees are the ones who make the, all of the final decisions. So they need your input whenever you have a chance. The circulation support list. As circulators, most of you have probably consulted this a few thousand times. One of the problems we've been running into recently, though, is staff shifts. People are moving in and out of libraries. So if you uh, haven't, I would appreciate it if you would take a few minutes sometime in the next week or so and confirm that the contacts at your library are actually who everyone should be reaching out to. Uh, we may be doing a poll later in the year to try to do some additional cleanup, but anything we can do preemptively and make sure that we are talking to the people who need to be talked to so that we can get things done is appreciated. When do you need to put in an help desk ticket? Anytime you have a technical issue, or a glitch. It brings up an unknown error, particularly if it's doing it consistently. Occasionally you get network failures where the computer gets tired, what have you. If something's just acting weird, go ahead and put in a ticket. Make sure you include as much information as possible. Screenshots if you can, time of day, who was involved, what items were involved, what you were trying to do. Anything you can tell us about your workflow is helpful too. Because sometimes it's just a question of searching the exact right string in the logs for us to find out what it is that we need to look into further. You need to do batch record updates. To a limited extent, we can come in and help you clean up a batch of records at one time. If you need to do any cross-system patron merging, that does require a ticket. Uh, your patrons, you can merge locally as long as they're not in collections. If it's multiple systems, we do that here on the state level just because we need written confirmation from all libraries involved that these are the same people. Uh, as Laura was noting, there are so many ways for us to have problems with duplicate patron names that it can make it very challenging when you're trying to determine sometimes if patrons really need to be merged or if they just happen to be two people born on the opposite sides of the state on the same day, whose parents were very fond of the same names at the same time. And it sounds crazy, but it happens. I've seen it happen a couple of times now. Uh, and as a reminder, as long as either of the accounts, or there could be more than two, but as long as any of the accounts are in collections, we cannot merge until the collections process has been completed and the funds received. If you need help with, the t with reporting, 
you can put in a help desk ticket to either get assistance with parsing your results. Uh, occasionally, if there is a um, something that is beyond the capabilities of the reporter, Bob can help you out by doing a direct SQL uh, script. Uh, or we can help you build a template that will meet your needs. When to talk to me. Anytime you have policy or workflow questions, feel free to contact me. If you need to make recommendations for policies, procedures, training, software development, talk to me or any of the committee members. Uh, if you need to update your library contact information, you can contact me or you can put in a help desk ticket. Uh, depending on where it needs to be updated, you're probably safest doing both because I, tend, I maintain all of the contact lists that are outside of Evergreen. Uh, if you have any purchasing projects you'd like us to work on, if you have problems with e, uh, Evergreen Indiana payment program transactions, uh, this happens every once in a while. It's not a huge deal, but we need to know about it sooner rather than later. Official policy says if you do not notify us within 72 hours of there being a problem, your library may be held accountable for those funds until the succeeding quarter. Uh, if you have questions about that, I can talk about that later, uh, particularly with your bookkeepers, because I know that sounds difficult, but um, it can be a, a rather involved process. So we would like to get that cleared up as quickly as possible so that there's the least impact possible. Uh, I do a lot of custom report building. Uh, I work with people to get through the process of how to actually use reports. And I am currently building reports training. So if you have any uh, need for assistance with reports, let me know. And finally here, I've got requesting mediation with another system. I'm not suggesting that everyone immediately run out and start trying to tattle on their neighbors. Um, but we all run into situations where occasionally an administrative review is required. Um, maybe that a library has just missed out on a change of policy and need to be made aware of it. If you are not comfortable speaking with your partner at that library, whether it's a circulation manager or the director, Feel free to contact me uh, if you think it's a larger issue that needs consortium attention. Again, uh, I can work with the EC and our IT team to uh, help ensure that we're all on the same page when it comes to how we're getting things done. When do you want to talk to the listserv? Well, that should be any time you need a wide variety of input. We've got a lot of very creative, smart, communicative types out there. Use the listservs. Mind that talent. If you have any success stories, we can all, we are all always happy to be reminded about the good things that we are doing. So be sure to share your success stories when you have them. Um, and whenever we've got policy and procedure projects, if you have thoughts that you'd like to share with the community at large, go ahead. That's what our listservs are there for. It's to provide a forum for us to have an open, but courteous discussion on any of the issues that come up in our libraries. They are moderated, though, so please be nice. Uh, hopefully, I've seen all of you at one of these at some time or another, but we've got our round tables, both webinars and in person, we have committee meetings. Committee meetings are open, so if there is an issue that comes up that is important to your library, please feel free to send someone. You don't need to ask permission. You don't need to get an extra invitation. Just show up. Uh, and, of course, we had the annual conference. One of the things that the Patron Services Committee is discussing right now is the possibility of implementing a recommendation to relay information to libraries when packages or materials go astray in the transit process. Uh, we are going to be revising the library short name list to try to make things a little more um, clear so that we don't have quite as many libraries with quite as many similar names. That will be later this fall. That may actually be implemented as part of the upgrade. Uh, I'm not sure on the timeline on that, but it is coming. All right, that's the end of my slides, which means 
it is time to open up the rest of the discussion. Are there any other issues, things you'd like to discuss? Okay, I will answer that one. A patron comes in, they have an existing card with existing fines. If you want to move them over because they have they now they now have proof of residency in your community. The first step is to identify the fact that this is definitely the same patron. Once you find the account, you can change their home library, update their address. If you wish, you may want to put a note on the account indicating that uh, there was uh, that you have updated and changed which library they belong to. Once you've done that, uh, you give them a new card and they're all set. Now, $8.75, I would definitely encourage them to pay it off, but that is below our threshold. So they are not required to clear that bill before they transfer to your community. And Anita comments that um, when a patron moves, we shouldn't update their information. That's where actually tracking that information using a patron note will be very helpful. And yeah, you have to take the time to confirm and take a look at the patron's record to make sure that there are valuable notes there and not just a string of we couldn't get in touch with this phone number. Go ahead and clear those out. If you run across a patron who's got 20 or 30 of those, clear those out because notes, that is where we really have our best opportunity to communicate amongst ourselves when it comes to patrons. You don't want to always put that information in an alert because it's not really an alert. It really belongs in the note field so that we can access it, track it, retain it as needed, but not at, not alarm anybody or create a situation where there's a lot of extra stuff on the screen in the meantime. And yes, if we could get them to clear all their debts, that would be fantastic. I'm sure we would all love to have that one happen. Sooner rather than later. <laughs> We often add the, the current address as a new address and make it the mailing and billing address, but not erasing the old address. Okay. So it stays as a legacy address. That's a good idea. Mm. I don't know that there is a legal issue with uh, allowing for a plaque card to be paid for using the online interface where the problem lies then is that uh, I, I suggest what your bookkeeper is concerned about is the fact that you don't see those funds for a significant period of time and you have to turn around and turn those in quarterly. They have concerns that they um, are negatively balancing that account. Um, I'll have to talk to LDO and see if there is anything on the books. I am not aware of any legal reason why you can't accept an online credit card payment but uh, certainly do not want to put anybody's library into dire straits with the auditors. So I will have to follow up on that one. As long as the patron has paid for their plaque, um, it, you wouldn't, they can't pay for a bill that hasn't been assessed. So they would have had to have come to the desk to request the card, gotten the updated card, and potentially paid for it on the spot just using an OPAC that was right there. So there are there are scenarios in which the patron, uh, a plaque card holder, could could pay on the spot using our current online payment portal. There you go. And then they held the card until the account was paid. So because it's a manual bill, it doesn't. You have that ability to hold the card until the uh, account is cleared, but then they have their updated information. And yes, actually we will probably publish the list of short names prior to the change just so that everyone has a chance to disseminate that amongst their staff because we're going to try to make it as apparent as possible, but some of us have been dealing with the old short names now for quite some time and uh, it will definitely be an adjustment. Expired and inactive counts are being purged. If the patron is in perfect standing after three years of non-use, so um, right now, in order for us to delete account, it has to have a, for us to have deleted the account when the script ran this morning. The account would have had to have expired on October 18th, 
2012, they could have no bills, no bars, and no items still associated with their account, including claims returned. Uh, as far as all short names, I, it's going to depend. I think that's going to be quite a mess, but um, it's entirely possible that 90% of libraries will see a change, just so that we um, have, well, if nothing else, we're going to add a, a locative suffix, so that will definitely change for everyone. The extent to which the leader will change will be different as we try to come up with ways to make sure that everything's as unique as possible. The system will allow a patron to have three claimed returned items on their account at any one time. Uh, after that, it will refuse to allow uh, materials to claim. And after a year, it's really libraries should try to make a decision whether or not they want to build a patron or assume the material is missing and lose it, or uh, market missing. Anybody want to talk age protection? I started to ask that earlier. I know that was, that was uh, quite interesting to talk with everybody about at the last two regional roundtables. Uh, but I'm always curious to hear how other libraries are talking about implementing it. Okay, yeah, Pendleville's already already went that way. And in case anyone was concerned, we're not talking about changing consortium defaults or anything like that. This is this age protection is something that has always been up to the libraries to determine. So um, this is just a question of whether or not you're choosing to implement it, and if so, how it goes. Curious to hear. I know there's a lot that has to go into consideration, whether it's your, you have a large browsing population or you have multiple branches that need service. Uh, all that stuff has to play into consideration, so definitely understand where you're coming from with that. So this is why I need to run more reports. I, I already run lots and lots of them, you know, but I, I'm, I've been, I'm impressed in the discussions just how many libraries are um, actively moving forward with, uh, or have had three-month age protection on certain collections in place for quite some time. Uh, the past policy that it's still in development, we're working on it, it's, uh, it's going to be quite a composite of information once we get it all done because it's going to be not just procedures, it's going to have an educational component for uh, libraries that are trying to train their staff in what to look for, not just for bed bugs, uh, but also other pests including you know, cockroaches and fleas and silverfish, which, you know, those aren't harmful to people in the same way that the others can be, but um, the last thing anybody wants is a silverfish infestation in their books because that will, that will wreak havoc on your collection. So uh, at this stage, we'll probably do a formal release. Uh, Sooner if we can, but the latest I see it happening at this point will be annual conference, which is uh, March 31st and April 1st, 2016. Please feel free to reach out at any time. In the meantime, I will let you get back to your work. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you to Laura and Virginia for presenting. It's been a pleasure to share this Monday morning with you. Have a great day.